Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of VMware's Partnership Perspectives. I'm Kathleen Tandy, Vice President of Global Partner and Alliances Marketing at VMware, and I'm pleased to bring you the stories and trends from VMware industry analysts, partners, and executives. This week, I'm joined by Muge Tanik, General Manager of Global Accounts at Intel. In her role, Muge and her team manage Intel's relationships with solution vendors and are responsible for aligning innovation roadmaps, ensuring solution offerings run on Intel's latest and greatest platforms, and compiling ISV's product feedback to enhance end user experiences. During our conversation, we discussed how customers are using technology to move their businesses forward as they shift to as a service models, multi-cloud and edge to cloud strategies, and Intel and VMware's long history of innovation, including recent announcements around highly secure remote work offerings with Intel's vPro platform and VMware Workspace ONE. Please listen to the full conversation now. Muge, welcome to Partnership Perspectives. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. And I am very happy to have this opportunity to talk with you on a number of different levels. As you know, many people know, Intel and VMware share many close ties over the years, um, including our CEO, which we'll get to talk to in a little bit. Um, and both companies are going through major transformations right now, as much as uh, you know, many of our customers and a lot of the industry is. So I'm really excited to get your perspectives from one of the giants in the industry um, on the transitions that we're seeing in the industry related to multi-cloud and even uh, a number of the transformations going on within Intel. Okay, let's start with you and your current role at Intel. Could you start by sharing with our listeners what is your role and what is the role of the team that you lead on Intel's behalf? Thanks again for having me, Kathleen. I do manage ISVs, quote-unquote, solution vendors at Intel. Those solution vendors are critical for us or for any company like us because we are kind of bringing our platforms to you guys and optimizing your solutions on top of our platforms. So the number one priority for us, we are trying to align our roadmaps so that when the solution vendors launches new solutions, we make sure that they're all running on latest and greatest Intel platforms. We are bringing day zero launch support to each other. We are also working together to come up with new disruptive new cases and the business models to provide the best solutions and the best experience to our customers. You mentioned innovation. Innovation starts with that, right? We look at the customers, the pain points that they have, and how we can help them to address those pain points. So ISVs are very, very critical for us. And also it is really critical for us to get the feedback. So we have a feedback loop from the ISVs. They are the ones, they test our platforms. They give product feedback all the way to the architects and Intel. So we have a deep, deep collaboration with the solution vendors and I am managing that. And my team is responsible. We cover the solution vendors. As you're talking about that, I'm thinking, I just had a call early this afternoon with our vice president of our ISV ecosystem and very similar conversation. I think as those of us who deliver and are architects of technology platforms, and I certainly think of Intel as a major player within a technology platform, having those relationships with those ISV partners and helping to build that broader ecosystem to deliver more use cases for your customers to be able to help them solve problems is within all of our interests. And just interesting, it's like, as you're saying it from Intel's perspective, I'm thinking we're having those exact same conversations, but from our perspective, and at the end of the day, it's helping customers solve our problems and solve them in unique and different ways. Absolutely, absolutely. I wanted to just start with, and I can't believe this was just last year, it was really only 15 months ago, Last year, Pat Gelsinger transitioned from CEO at VMware to CEO at Intel. He went back home and it was just really funny having the fact my husband works there. I worked there. I was up early at the dining room table, you know, working. My chat and text started blowing up. He comes in to make coffee and I said, guess what? 
you get Pat. Pat's yeah. going over to you. We had Pat for eight years, although Intel had him longer. What's it like having Pat as your new CEO? And what impact have you seen that this has been driving for you and for looking after your ISV relationships? Has this had broadly within Intel in your world over the last year? And also, what impact do you think it's had on the VMware Intel partnership? So I was one of the lucky ones. I worked with Pat before he left Intel. And he was a strong, strong leader at Intel. And he came back even stronger. When he was with Intel, he had this deep hardware and and architecture, obviously, mind and leadership. But then with VMware experience, he knows the cloud. He has this cloud first approach. He knows solutions. So he came back even stronger than before. Now he has this solution mindset. There's no hardware and software. There's a whole solution. We are so excited. I cannot even tell you how jazzed the employees are. The morale is so high. And he's bringing back the end grow era. Probably you are familiar with Andy Grow. He's a legend in the industry and the listeners should remember him. And Pat was a TA to Andy Grow. So he's bringing back that era, that innovation spirit, that passion and that drive. So I cannot tell you how much impact, forget about the strategy, that energy is really impacting the company. Somebody told me a funny story One of our leaders, he was in a meeting with Pat. He said that we are all on a treadmill, but Pat is pushing on the incline uh, uh, mode. Like we are going steeper and steeper and faster and faster. Like he, he brought the energy. He's like, you need to go faster. So what is the impact that he has on the strategy? First of all, he came and he really defined Intel's edge to cloud strategy. And he organized the business units and whole company around it. And he changed the leadership. Now we have the new business units and we have new leadership. If you look at VMware's edge to cloud strategy and Intel's edge to cloud strategy, it is not too different right now. We are really trying to be the consistent infrastructure vendors providing the most optimized and and secure solutions, edge to cloud and cloud to cloud to our customers. So from the strategy perspective and from our engagement partnership perspective, there's no strategic differences. I mean, we are still following the same strategy as Pat was on the other side. But since he came on board, he has been a big support for me personally he is really helping me to influence the, the decision makers and the leadership on the Intel side to go deeper and bigger with VMware. Needless to say, what a big brain he is. And every day he comes up with a new disruptive ideas. And he's really challenging us. Just firsthand, having also worked with Pat, I know what a relentless passion he has around innovation, a growth mindset. He doesn't sleep very much either. It's really no. hard about being his chief of staff now and gets up and very, and very, very disciplined, very, very disciplined yes. focus. And, but it's great to see the energy that's infused and the strong alignment. As you were talking about his whole integrated solutions mindset, it's also been fascinating, not just to the businesses, but to see how he's bringing that innovation approach, even to rethinking about manufacturing and helping to reinvigorate that at Intel and thinking of it as a manufacturing as a service, the whole as a service mindset, which has impacted so much of our industry, how he can bring that point of view to help reinvigorate a model which hadn't really changed for many years. So it's worth mentioning, probably you have been watching him on the news. He was at the State of the Union. He was invited He has been making huge investments in the country, like he has invested, I believe, around $75 billion into the new factories. So he has been making a lot of investments and influencing the government to make more investments. So we are in a new era. You were just mentioning how closely, you know, as Pat brought in, not only with reinvigorating kind of the culture and the the strategy at a number of different levels, 
how he reorganized and thinking about the edge to cloud strategy and how closely that's aligned to VMware. And the world of multi-cloud has been front and center at core to what we're calling VMware's kind of act three, how we are transforming. And really it's all about, you know, as you had said, responding to the needs of customers. We have data, I'm sure Pat and you have the same data, which is showing that increasingly the majority of customers are almost at three clouds and it's just going to grow as they're looking at managing different clouds for different workloads. And that's the entire cloud world, which is from your on-premise private data center cloud to a hybrid cloud model to full multi-cloud public cloud to edge, you know, an edge cloud in that entire spectrum, which is what we consider really multi-cloud. As you've aligned it, how does Intel approaching multi-cloud, we can think of it as software, we can think of it as using cloud workloads, but help connect the dots for our listeners to how that connects to a semiconductor manufacturer, although there's a lot of software involved, but to that strategy and how it's informing your strategy and choices all focused on at the end of the day to help support our customers. I was at your partner event and I listened to Raghu's keynote and he started his keynote saying that we are in the multi-cloud era. And absolutely, definitely that is the case. So. I just want to kind of oversimplify it and I want to show the perspective what if what it means from the enterprise customer's perspective. Imagine that you're a big company like Intel, you have global locations, you have thousands of employees, and you have so many different applications, hardware, devices that that your employees are using all around the world which means that there's a lot of inconsistencies in the infrastructure from the solution, from the software and the hardware perspective. So imagine an application. So how do you really port that application from edge to cloud and cloud to cloud in the most secure way, most user experience way? It, it has to be very transparent for the end customers, hassle-free. And you provide the best operations and the manageability, right? It's a big challenge in itself. So what we are doing, let me tell you what we are doing as Intel, and then I can tell what we are doing with VMware. So at Intel, obviously, simple way to explain is that in this most inconsistent environment, we are trying to provide the most consistent infrastructure, edge to cloud, cloud to cloud so that the application transportation, security, manageability, and the operations will be much more smoother. It starts with our roadmap. Obviously, we have the most advanced roadmap, starting from the CPUs to the XPUs and the accelerators. And the solution, hardware in itself doesn't mean much, and we have a lot of solutions on top of the hardware, and then we work with the solution vendors like yourselves, we get together with VMware and we have this edge to cloud strategy. And starting from the edge, let me give you a couple of examples. So at the edge with VMware, we are trying to provide the secure access point for the digital workers. Your Workspace ONE, a solution on top of Intel's vPro solution, that's the most secure access point from any edge point. It can be somebody's home, it can be from an office. And then when we come towards to the data center, we are focusing on a couple of things. One, highly optimized container solutions. As you know that the open platforms, Kubernetes containers are playing a big role in multi-cloud environment. And we are building solutions together with you based on containers. And we have really innovative projects. We call them incubation projects. A couple of them we announced at VMworld last year. For example, memory tiering. Like in the multi-cloud environment, there are pockets of memory clusters. How do you leverage them in the best way? How do you move the workloads from one packet to another one? We have a new IPU solution together. We announced it. We are going to release it in the market in the coming years. And IPUs are starting to play a lot of role. We are distributing security on IPUs. We are distributing memory and storage on IPUs. So these are the couple of ones that I can give it as an example. 
Basically, if I have to summarize, Intel and VMware, we are providing highly secure and optimized environments for the distributed workloads. I think you commented on a number of recurring themes that I hear from leaders across the industry, whether it's other partners from our customers, executives across the board, which I think really speak to the needs that we're seeing right now. One is complexity, just which is in everything, you know, it's been accelerated by everybody embracing and kind of jumping into the deep end of the pool when it comes to accelerating digital transformation, because companies have had no choice over the last couple of years, but a lot of people have had to, you just full on embrace it. And that's led to a lot of disconnected and technology initiatives across their infrastructure. It's just led to greater complexity across the entire stack. I mean, there's one thing that I keep hearing is is complexity. So being able to provide the most consistent and common underlying platform, which can help remove any kind of complexity is just music to any CIO's ears. The other one that is interesting that you brought up, and we'd love to get your thoughts on Edge, but you talked about secure access for Edge. You talked about building, using new IP solutions and, and innovation there around security. Security also just has been elevated to the forefront in terms of our customers' eyes. New challenges with having these very distributed workforces, and not only not just workforces, workforces, and then a more distributed digital engagement scenario with your customers. More people relying on a digital transaction to be able to reach customers, engage, transact the business, and having the business itself being that way. So we're seeing security just continue to skyrocket in terms of interest and need. I wish you could share what the roadmap was around your IP solutions around security, but we'll just have to probably wait around that. But I think both of those are critical areas that there's just a huge amount of need in the industry. Absolutely. The security is... I don't want to disclose too much, but you will hear from Intel and VMware in the coming years that are coming months, new announcements around it. It's so critical. You know, when Pat was with uh, VMware, he was talking about security and here we are doing the same. So it's, I mean, we are putting security at the chip level. And on top of that, you guys have your security solutions. Like we are double security, the solutions is less headache and peaceful sleep for the IT managers. (laughs) Which I'm sure they'll appreciate all of it because the world has given them nothing but headaches right now in terms of uh, the challenges that they have. I'm sure you guys also have your models and research and projections on the industry. Wanted to dig in a little bit around edge and how you guys are thinking about edge solutions. I think Even recently this week, Raghu was quoted saying that he believes the edge cloud and the number of workloads at the edge will dwarf public cloud. I don't know if I got that exactly right, but basically huge growth opportunity. A lot of people predicting that edge will be even bigger than core data center workloads. Curious how how that is factoring into, again, not to disclose any private roadmap plans, but how is that being factored into how Intel is thinking about driving its business forward? Well, we are trying to re-innovate Edge. And actually, we don't don't need to make too much effort around it because as Regu said, the industry is moving towards that direction. From our perspective, in the past, you would see most of compute was consumed at the data center. Now we see compute is consumed at the edge. The distance between the edge and data center is getting closer and closer. So we see a lot of workloads and compute is moving and compute power is moving at the edge. Let me tell you what we are doing with VMware. Last year, actually, Pat announced it multiple times. At the edge, we cannot really separate edge from the telco cloud. We have a huge joint telco cloud partnership your ORAN solution with Intel's FlexRAN solution. And it's bringing a lot of power to telcos and helping them to offer secure cloud services to their customers. This was announced last year. We joined the one couple of telcos and we are scaling with that solution. It is already making a lot of difference. You will see more and more announcements from both companies soon. 
But like I mentioned, we started with the vPro and Workspace ONE enablement. Now those solutions are working very optimized, highly optimized, working very well together. It became GA recently, so we are really pushing for that solution at the edge. But I think that the focus that we have is, again, the security. And we are trying to make that edge access point highly, highly secure. Not at the edge, but when you're porting the applications from the edge to the cloud as well. In that sense, we have deep collaboration with your networking team. We cannot really separate networking. When you say edge to cloud, there's networking in the middle. So enterprise networking and networking security is big. Our teams has been working on that for years. And now we have solutions and we are offering that security to our end customers. I honestly do not want to disclose more on the edge, but hopefully this this Explore, VMware Explore, uh, we will have more announcements together. That is exciting. A great teaser for people to pay attention. Intel will be one of our Global Diamond sponsors and happy to have you there. I'm looking forward to what that news is. I would also imagine, as you were talking about Intel's roadmaps around new IPU solutions for security, memory, and storage, for example, even your edge roadmaps is playing a role in thinking about the needs and how does that influence storage? How does that influence memory architectures? You mentioned security already. I'm sure that moving more compute to the edge brings different requirements, which I'm sure is being integrated and reflected even those solution roadmaps. We will see IPUs more and more. What we are doing in a nutshell, obviously, to get the best TCO value and to get the most performance from your server, Xeon, we are offloading some workloads onto the IPU. So this way, your server, your Xeon CPU does not have to compute all the workloads. Some of them can be offloaded to the IPU and you give much power and release to the CPU. And overall, you get more total cost of ownership value out of it. So that's the simple way of looking at it. And we started with some of the networking workloads. And again, this is not confidential. We announced it at VMworld last year. Our Mount Evans platform is being used on the IPU platform with your CPB organization. We are developing the solution on top of that. And that will be a GA next year. So just a long tradition and really exciting to hear about the continuing innovations at the core technology front, but all at the end of the day, Muge connected to how our customers' needs are evolving, how they are using technology to drive their business forward. And these long-term roadmaps are front and center driving innovation to help move our customers' businesses forward. It's driven by the customer's needs. It's everything starts with that. How can we give the best experience to the customers? How can we solve their pain points? And we have been talking about the innovation. We didn't talk about the business models. You know, there are new business models are coming into the picture. All the solution vendors are moving into the SaaS model. All the infrastructure vendors are moving into the infrastructure as a service model. Consumers now want to consume any solution, any product at the time that they want to consume and they want to pay as much as they consume. It's, it's the pay-per-view model. These are all huge changes. We all appreciate that the companies like our size, it's not easy to switch your business model. We're going through those same things too. And again, all driven by customers who want to stream. They don't want to own. Everyone wants to stream and pay as you go, pay per view. Absolutely. I mean, it's having driving forces across, I think, every aspect of our industry. There's no safe space or place that's unchanged. So, Amugi, I'd love to switch gears right now and talk a little bit about your career journey, which I find fascinating. You've been with Intel the majority of your career, not your whole career, but but the majority of your career, which has started in Turkey, led you to California, right, which is a huge change with a number of different opportunities in between and a little stint in a different industry, which I want to touch base on. But I would love if you could just share an overview of how you got started in Turkey, how that led you to Silicon Valley and California. Well, it's a long journey. It feels like ages ago. Yeah, I started coincidentally in the IT industry in Turkey. 
and started to work for an IBM dealer. <laughs> IBM, an IBM dealer. <laughs> Love that. Yes, and I was trying to sell solutions in an emerging country 30 years ago. Like, who wants to pay for a solution? Nobody wanted to buy licenses at the time. They would copy it and they would consume it and replicate it. So it started like that. And I wanted to come to the U.S. for my master's degree. So I came to the U.S. I earned my master's degree and I stayed here. I started to work for a software company in Boston, a software startup. Boston used to be kind of like a Silicon Valley at the time. All the were, yes. And I'm, I'm blanking on the big deck. Yes, I worked for DEC. First, I worked for DEC, and then I joined a solution software startup. You know, in the startups, you do everything. Like, I really defined their partner and the ISV strategy starting from the pricing scheme, training, everything, and recruitment. So I was recruiting global ISVs for them. When I was doing Happily, Intel approached to me, and they said that they want to hire a country manager to start up the subsidiary in Turkey. So as you can tell from my accent, I am a Turkish native. I was born and raised in Turkey. And I went back to Turkey with Intel. I lived in a hotel for six months. Imagine that I am trying to establish a subsidiary in a country where at the time we didn't even have the, how do you say it, the internet lines. I'm on the analog telephone in the hotel trying to have a conference call with the U.S. And my line is cut like five times in the middle of the meeting. Huge, huge challenges. So I remember waking up the first day in the hotel room and thinking, where am I going to start from? There's no intel in Turkey, no employees, no office, no customers, nothing. And this is my day one job at Intel. It's not like I had experience in the headquarters before. So I started from there. Really, it was, I mean, I will write a book. There are so many funny stories. It does uh, sound like a really good book. Yes. <laughs> And it became very successful. It, uh, Turkey became the regional headquarters. And then I was promoted to the headquarters to the Silicon Valley. And I worked in Intel for about 17 years. And then very unexpectedly, I was reached by Walmart.com. One day, Walmart.com's new CEO and his vice president they reached out to me. I didn't know them. I knew the vice president, but I didn't know the CEO. They reached out to me and they invited me for dinner. And he offered me a job on the spot. He wanted me to start up their international business unit. And I was really stunned. I asked him, why me? I don't know online retail. I don't know retail. I don't know online retail. <laughs> and I'm not a technologist. I'm a business, uh, business uh, leader. And he said that this is exactly why I want you. I want you to start an international business. So I joined them. Huge risk. I mean, I inherited a team, a bright team. Everybody knew the business much better than me. <laughs> very ambitious Ivy League school graduates. I mean, very, very bright team. It was a challenge. Like, how do you establish yourself as a new leader when you know less about the job? <laughs> and the industry than your employees. It was challenging, but it was so, so satisfying. It was very successful. Everything went, I mean, I learned a lot, but I couldn't stay too far from Intel. My friends from Intel, they reached out, they're like, come back. And then I went back to Intel, I think four and a half years ago. Yeah, I'm here. So I was the first generation of, in my family to migrate from Turkey to the United States. So I didn't have any family members. It was challenging. It was very challenging. I love hearing that story. One, you know, I also just want to acknowledge, you know, we're talking about late 90s, right, joining Intel and talking about the career that you've had inventing in technology as a woman as well been in this career a long time as well and continues to be a very male dominated field. And I think what comes through to me, Muge, with your career journey is one, a high propensity for risk taking, first of all, going into new territory, right? Being a builder, building that first office, starting from scratch, going, where the hell do I start? Because I've got no employee, no, you know, what, what do I do? 
Although I want to say even then, it was ironic as you were trying to sell solutions in Turkey back when you were working for the IBM dealership. We just wanted to use what we needed. I'm like, we're kind of coming full circle back to customers just wanting pay per view, pay per use, but within a solution mindset. So in some ways, everything that's old is new again. But you're starting from scratch there, starting from scratch with Walmart, establishing your credibility, building new businesses. And I think that's the, the hallmark of this industry, which keeps those of us engaged, the opportunity to build from scratch, to imagine new frontiers and the permission and the opportunity, if you're willing to take, take it, to be able to make a mark. And it's been just fantastic to see what you've, all the marks that you've made in your career over the years. Yeah, they always say that follow your dream. It's very, very true. Very, very true. It's like if you dream about something, you go after that with that passion, with that persistence, there's nothing that you cannot do. Yeah. I truly believe in that. I'm curious, you mentioned walmart.com, which was also a new emerging business in the days when you joined that. Totally different from a semiconductor industry and then going back. I'm wondering what were a couple of the key ways that that experience shifted or changed or informed your perspective in ways you then brought back to Intel that you wouldn't have had if you hadn't had that experience? Well, I was on the other side of the table. I was managing a cloud-based business and all the software and hardware vendors was coming and pitching to me to leverage their solutions. So I really had the perspective from the customer perspective. I was a customer. For all these years, I was a vendor, technology vendor, and then I became a technology customer. It gave me a huge, huge perspective. So now, since I came back to Intel, I challenge our teams from the customer point of view. People make fun of me internally. They know me very well. Like I'm very transparent. I'm very direct. And I usually challenge them in the meetings. I ask the question, are we drinking our own Kool-Aid? Are we looking at it from the customer's perspective? So I can make the argument from the customer's perspective. And that helped me tremendously in my job. That's great with the credibility of having sat at that side and being able to bring that in. And at the end of the day, coming back to, and I know that's as much as Pat loves technology, he's also very much thinking about the customer and instilled that in our values and your values and kind of ending where we began, which is all around focusing on how we can help our customers utilize the incredible power of the technology that we're inventing together to help advance their business and and their purpose and their missions. Absolutely. This is why he's very successful. Yeah, absolutely. And then provides opportunities for people who share those same perspectives to also be part of the transformation. So, well, Mugi, let's wrap up with some lighter questions away from those heavier topics. I'm curious, what are you reading, watching, or listening to these days that helps continue to kind of fuel new perspectives that you can bring to your work? So first of all, for years, I made one mistake, and I realized that when I matured. The only thing that I was reading was regarding my business for years. And then I realized that I do not have a rounded perspective. You don't realize how much you learn from the uh, different industries, from different hobbies, for different interactions. So then I started to enlarge my reading, listening, and watching. And I started to be more, more spiritual in the last couple of years. I mean, I was never a spiritual person. I was like data oriented. I don't believe in anything which is not proven. Like it's just all like data. But now I started to think about the energy, the karma. How can I mature? What do I want in life? How do I influence people around me? So long of the short story, what, first of all, I'm a big sports fan. So I do play tennis. And actually, I broke my wrist recently and I had two surgeries. Painful. (laughs) Painful, but I'm not going to give up playing tennis. Good. Good for you. So I'm trying to be sports is extremely beneficial for our mind, for our body. So I am a huge sports fan and I play sports and I do exercise regularly. And I am a religious MBA follower. 
So I don't know if you guys are following. Oh, of course. We are rooting for the warriors. <laughs> Absolutely. So what I'm reading right now, I am listening two books and I'm reading one book. And none of them are work related. One thing is that I am so interested in the biographies. One is Einstein's biography that I'm listening, audiobook. And the other audiobook is that I started to listen after my injury, When the Body Says No. It's by mm-hmm. Dr. Gaber Mate. And he claims that he's talking about the hidden stress and how it is impacting our health. And he's even like thinking that the accidents may not be really accidents. It shows that stress, like stress tightens your muscles and all that stuff. So after my injury, I started to read that and I'm learning a lot, but it is also really an eye opener. So I recommend everybody to have a look at that, read that book. And the other one, the third one is, it's going back to my Turkish roots. There's a new rising writer in England. She's Turkish, but she was born and raised in England. Her name is Elif Shafak. She wrote a book about Cyprus, the island, and talking about a family migrated from Cyprus, a Turkish family to England talking about the belonging, identity, trauma. So it was a very interesting book. So I'm about to finish that one. So these are the things that I am reading and watching now. Well, I think you've certainly achieved the well-rounded in terms of you have history and personal journeys, you have physical and stress, and then kind of fascinating inspiration and just thinking about Einstein biography, about science, about a person and a historical perspective as well. I love asking this question because I get great suggestions. Definitely want to pick up when the body says no and the hidden forms of stress. Because I think also as those of us are leaders, as we continue to lead organizations through this continuing global pandemic, which is not over yet, we just had to shut down our Bay Area site to essential workers. We try, we're all coming back and no, not quite ready yet. So I think all of these things are creating hidden forms of stress that those leading teams need to be really aware of so that we can think about how we are leading our teams, helping engage our teams, helping manage everybody continue to be able to be their full self, both in their life and work, because those lines have so much blurred. So love those recommendations. The last question that I'd love to ask you and close on is, what is the best advice you've ever received, either professionally or personally? It's not an advice that I received from anybody. That's that's the, the learning from a book that I read. So I have another recommendation for you, book recommendation for you. It is a very short, page-turning, small book. It's very basic and essential. The name of the book is Four Rules. And it is really simply advising four things. And I believe, it's really stuck with me. I believe that these are really basics. Rule number one, do your best, whatever your best is. Rule number two, don't take anything personal. Rule number three, be impeccable with your words. What it means by that is sometimes we sabotage ourselves with the background talking. Oh, you cannot do that. You're not not good at this. You're not good. You didn't do a good job. So don't talk to yourself in a negative way. I totally believe in the power of positive thinking. And also fourth, don't make assumptions. I was making a lot of assumptions and big mistakes. And since I read that book, it's really stuck with me. Actually, on my wall here, I listed those four rules. I remind myself those four rules every day. I love that. While I'm listening to myself, I never thought that I was spiritual, but I I think I turned to be a very spiritual person recently. Why don't we call that acquired wisdom, Muge, from all of the amazing experiences that you've had and the approach that you've had in terms of always learning, opening yourself up to new opportunities, taking risks, just new frontiers. And it's been just a pleasure to talk with you about how that's inspired your career journey, 
how that's inspiring those perspectives you're bringing to the role that you have today leading the ISV relationships for Intel, but at the end of the day, always focused on how can we help drive our customers forward. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. It's just been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. Likewise, and it was so much fun. We should talk more often. Absolutely. And we're back. I really enjoyed that conversation. It was particularly interesting to hear about Muge's fascinating career journey and to hear her perspective on Pat Gelsinger's impact since he rejoined Intel. To learn more about the exciting joint innovations Intel and VMware are collaborating on, be sure to register for this year's VMware Explore, where Intel will be a global diamond sponsor. I hope you enjoyed this insightful conversation too. To learn more about VMware, please visit vmware.com. To connect with Muge, you can find her on LinkedIn. Thank you for joining me on this episode today. Please remember to subscribe, follow, and review VMware Partnership Perspectives podcast from your streaming platform of choice. For more information on VMware's partner programs, please visit Partner Executive Edge at VMware.com. I'm Kathleen Tandy. Thanks for listening and hope to see you next time.